Thank you, Heather. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope fall has arrived in your neck of the woods. Uh, we're very excited to have this webinar today to talk about curriculum revisions in your department. And we have three great panelists who are going to discuss this with us this afternoon. Sharon Mosier, who is the Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas in Austin, is going to take the lead and sort of set the context for the conversation. And joining her are two other panelists, Carol Wicks, who is the interim assistant dean of this graduate school in the College of Science at Louisiana State University, and Mark Raines, who is a professor and chair of the geology department in the School of Geosciences at the University of South Florida. So Sharon, uh, please uh, take it away. OK, thank you, Prunati. Uh, just to sort of set the stage for this, as most of you or many of you may know, uh, we've had a multi-year effort uh, sponsored by NSF to look at the future of undergraduate geoscience education. And the goal of this was to have a national conversation about uh, undergraduate uh, geoscience education, uh, curriculum, uh, programs, uh, all a number of different objectives associated with this. Uh, for the purpose of today's discussion, the two objectives that uh, are most important would be identifying a consensus on what skills, competencies, and concepts are needed by undergraduate uh, geoscience majors, either to uh, be successful in the workforce or to uh, go to graduate school. And second, to facilitate curricular transformation across the country in uh, geoscience undergraduate programs. And we had three meetings and a survey. Uh, the first meeting we had was in 2014. We had about 200 people with the majority of them, 180 being uh, educators. It covered the whole spectrum of undergraduate geoscience education community, everything from two-year colleges up to research intensive R1 ones and we had some employers. And I think there was a surprising collective agreement uh, amongst the uh, summit participants. Uh, we followed that with a national-wide survey, which was taken by both uh, academics, predominantly about 360, as well as employers, about 105. 85% uh, of those were not people who participated in the summit. So, we felt like we had between those people and the people to summit, we had an extremely large group of people who had uh, weighed in on these subjects. And again, there was very strong agreement with the outcomes of the summit. And so this was really the first step in developing a high level community vision for undergraduate geoscience uh, education. We followed that with in 2015 with the geoscience employers workshop there were 46 uh, participants, which were dominantly geology and geophysics, but they spanned the whole spectrum of geoscience, employment, uh, energy, um, uh, environmental, uh, hydrology, uh, engineering, consulting, as well as government agencies, NASA, USGS, and so on. And they agreed with the outcomes of the summit and the um, survey, and they added significant granularity to that. Uh, following that, we had a Heads and Chairs Summit where we had 109 department leaders and the focus was on how do you implement uh, these recommendations and we came away with 96 individual action plans and again, we were looking at everything from two-year colleges to research intensive R1s. And our next step, which we're just starting, is to write the vision and change document that summarizes all the results as well as um, gives recommendations in terms of implementing and also uh, best practices that people have found successful. Uh, of those responses, uh, of those action plans, we got responses 12 to 18 months later from uh, essentially half of the uh, participants. Um, dominantly, uh, it was from PhD granting institutions and then uh, about you know 40 some percent of the responders were PhD granting institutions and then an equal number of masters, bachelors, um, granting institutions. 
and two-year colleges. Now, the two-year colleges focused mainly on pedagogy, which was a different one of our objectives. Uh, but in terms of curriculum, of the responders, um, essentially almost all of them had addressed curricular uh, redesign of some sort. And the most commonly used uh, method people use for implementing this was to use a curriculum matrix, which I'm sure our following speakers will talk about, sort of it, David Moak's sort of backward design look at um, a curriculum. And in using that, uh, the kinds of things people found was that they eliminated redundancies in uh, courses, they filled in gaps that they had realized were missing in their curriculum, uh, they revise the sequence of courses sometimes along uh, using sort of the core competency goals to try to increase the competency of their students in specific areas or skills. And a number of, of these institutions uh, have multiple degree options and they instituted a two-year sort of core curriculum that all of the options would take and then they could branch out into different things. Uh, strategies. Um, a lot of them said that it was very helpful to have an employer vetted community recommendations that they could use. Uh, they learned as we learned when we started the summit to begin with, that you need to focus on concepts and skills instead of courses. People argue about courses, but they tend to agree about what students need to know and be able to do. Uh, one of the questions that people often ask was, well, how are our bachelor's graduates doing? Are they getting into the grad schools we want them to? Are they getting jobs in you know, the industries that hire bachelors in our general area? And if the answer was no, then that helped enforce the idea that something needed to be done. Uh, retreats were found to be quite uh, helpful uh, because that way people were you know, sort of isolated and had to talk things through. Uh, people stressed open communication and transparency, uh, that you had to have faculty buy-in. It couldn't be a top-down process. It had to be bottom-up. And it really helped to have somebody who was basically a hero or a champion that would really push this through. Uh, next slide. Next. And I have just listed here you know, some of the common advice, uh, everything from patience, because it takes time, and in order to get faculty buy-in, you have to take time. Uh, you have to stress that this really will improve and be beneficial to our students. Uh, the concept and skills matrix is very useful. The fact that it, these are nationally vetted recommendations really helps. Um, people really like the CERT pages on retreat planning and backward design. Uh, the NAGT traveling workshops were thought to be helpful. Uh, making sure that you, you know, have a mechanism for in place for actually enforcing your proposed changes. And depending on the size of the faculty, and we've analyzed these in terms of not only the kind of institution, but also the size of the faculty. If you have a large faculty, having a core group is uh, the best approach, but you need to get uh, faculty buy-in first and then keep them updated. And then the last, bit of advice I heard a lot was to keep what to teach separate from how to teach. And with that, I would turn it over to one of the, the two people you're going to hear from uh, were very successful in uh, making changes. Thank you. So I'm Carol Wicks. I'm an interim associate dean in the graduate school at LSU. I was the department chair in geology and geophysics when the department went through this curriculum uh, reform that we did. So just tell you a little bit about LSU and the department, and then we'll get into what we did. So LSU's doctoral doctoral university, the highest research activity, or land, sea, and space grant, which gives us some interesting interactions within the department because within the department were land, sea, and space grant also. There's about 25,000 undergrads and 6,000 grads at LSU. The Department of Geology and Geophysics is within the College of Science. We're the smallest department in the College of Science. So we only have about 20 faculty. Um, there's kind of a breakdown on 17 tenure track and then um, we have several 
non-tenure yet promotable pathways in the department. We use those a lot. We have a graduate certificate and BSMS and PhD degrees. And specifically with our bachelor's degrees, we have concentrations in geology, geophysics, and environmental geology. And one thing I think that is maybe some other states notice this also, but our number of BS majors follows the price of oil, <laughs> both in a good way and a bad way. So over the last like five years or seven years, we've gone from like 50 to 150, and now we're back down to 50. So that is interesting to manage. May I have the next slide? Thank you. So what we decided to do is we wanted to look at our our curriculum. We had hired a bunch of new tenure track faculty members and they were excited to really dig into the curriculum and find out what we did and how we did it and why we did it the way we did it. So we used the MOOC, um, the course matrix. Um, we just thought that was a really good starting place for us. But what we had to do, because we're in Louisiana, <laughs> um, we had to we had to adjust some columns. So we spent a fair amount of time on figuring out if we had the right columns before we dove into the rows. And that's kind of how we started talking about the columns and rows. So for us, we have to drive 68 hours to get the outcrop. So that <laughs> puts a slightly different uh, slant on some things. Um, we also have a standalone departments of oceanography and geography that are actually world renowned. So some of the columns, we removed um, some of the other ones we needed to spend more focus on because we needed more mapping. Um, so we finally we got through all the columns and everybody agreed, and this was like several long faculty meetings. We decided, okay, we have the columns ready. So then we sent out spreadsheets to every faculty member for every course they were had a row that they were gonna enter their course into, and then they filled the grid out with zero not mentioned to three, you know, spend a lot of the class time on that. I'm sure many of you have done this. They all sent the spreadsheets back in. This is where it gets interesting. And I presented a summary sheet to the GNG faculty and there was a noticeable gap in quantitative, squ quantitative skills. Well, so this is interesting. The faculty didn't believe this. So they thought that everybody, every single faculty member thought that every other faculty member had messed up on their data entry. Um, so what we did, we said, okay, so we stepped through again how to fill the spreadsheet out. We sent it back out, making sure everyone knew that you had to enter a number in every single cell, even if that number was zero. Came back with the same result. There was still a gap in quantitative skills. Okay, next slide. So what we did at the time, our first year geology sequence was for everybody, for the general education majors and also for geology majors. They were all in that same class. And we thought, we'll divide this out. That will um, put the geology majors, and we made it geology majors and minors. We made those two new courses have math co-requisites, and we integrated the laboratory into the course. Um, so that core, both of those courses are four hours. The general education courses are three hour courses. That had a couple added advantages. The geology majors now actually know each other from the first day, because there's maybe 16, 20, you know, a small number of them. So instead of having them in the big auditoriums, they actually know each other. We also found that the faculty who are in the general education courses are more relaxed about what material and how much material to cover in the general education courses because there's no geology majors in there. That's kind of an advantage to the general education community also. They're still covering everything, but it's just they're a little more relaxed about it. So, you know, LSU's big university. It's got a lot of bureaucracy. So in order to get these courses approved, we had this first off get them out of the department, which is what we were spending all this time in. Then they had to go to the college. Then they had to go to the university's courses and curriculum committee. And they passed all of that. And I have some enrollment data here at the bottom. So the geology 1201, that's the physical geology for majors. It started at 12. The next fall, it was 16. And this fall, it's 33. Uh, the historical geology, which is a 1202 for majors, was at 7. And then the following spring, at 12, and of course, spring 2019 is not here yet, so we don't know what that enrollment is going to be. We are contemplating why we're getting that decline from the fall to the spring. Next slide. 
So we also knew that adding that math co-requisite to those first two courses was a really good step, but we wanted a course data, data analysis for geoscientists, and we wanted it in the first semester of the sophomore year. We wanted our majors to understand that geosciences are, is mathematically based. We didn't expect a lot, just some simple statistics and maybe using MATLAB to dig into some geoscience data sets. Design the course, three credit hours, two hours of lecture, one credit hour of laboratory, which was computer laboratory. Again, we needed to go through the courses and curriculum approval process, and we were not successful. Um, we were told that experimental statistics did statistics, and it wasn't geology's business to be doing statistics. I mean, we were told a whole bunch of things, so we sort of stepped back and tried to figure out what we were going to do because it was pretty clear we weren't going to get that course approved. We tried three times. Um, and so we kind of scoured through the course catalog and we found a course offered by computer science, statistics, and graphing and MATLAB that we now require our geology sophomores to take. And because computer science is a sister department, we're putting our students into the same section and we're feeding them geology data sets. So we're kind of backdooring that course a little bit, um, but we're getting that course, we're getting that statistics and that MATLAB in for, for our students. Uh, this is the first fall that our sophomores are actually taking that course. Um, so we'll see what happens. Next slide. So, I guess when I think about what we what we've learned about this, and to echo what what Sharon said, this this took a lot of time, this took a lot of energy, this took a lot of patience. We were years. I mean, literally 18 months in the course approval process and mapping it out, and it was 24 months before the first um, geology course with that math co-rec was taught. So those students are now in their third year. So we haven't really seen uh, what's going to happen when they, as they're mo moving into that very rigorous third year. And the students who are doing the, the computer science course, they're only in their second year because it took us so much longer to get that course done. So we're not really sure um, our, if we filled that quantitative gap or not. Um, we're certainly gathering data on the quantitative skills. We all know they're coming through. We're ramping up some of the, bridging some of the other gaps, but um, we're not quite through that process yet. And with that, I will turn it over. Well, thanks, Kel. That was a good good start. Um, we're a little bit behind um, LSU, um, and so I'll take you up to sort of um, sort of where um, almost where she took off, and, and you'll see the whole process. Then I think. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me tell you who we are. We are the University of South Florida system. Um, and we're a large metropolitan university, uh, Carnegie classification, doctoral universities, highest research activity, and we're big. Um, uh, we're about 50,000 students total, uh, about 37,000 undergraduate students and 12,000 graduate students. And we're spread amongst three campuses in the broader sort of West Central Florida metropolitan area. USF uh, uh, per se is, is in Tampa, about 85% of the students are there, but about 10% right? what's called USF St. Petersburg and another 5% at USF Sarasota Manatee, annual budget of about $1.7 billion. So we're a lot of people um, in a lot of places with a lot of money. Um, and uh, you'll see that that creates some sort of unique challenges for us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Pernodi introduced me as the chair of uh, the geology. That's that's true. I'm also the director of the School of Geosciences. So the whole headache is mine. Um, and uh, uh, we are we were formed in fall 2013. Um, we merged three degree granting programs: geology, geography, and environmental science and policy. Um, and that made us 43 faculty. Um, and you can see, I gave it, you know, the whole distribution of our bachelor's and uh, master's and PhD students there. Um, we're a pretty big geology group, 145. Like Carol, that's actually shrunk. I think we were upwards towards 200 um, when oil was $100 a barrel, and, and, and we've declined a bit since then. Geography used to be about 150 as well. It's um, shrunk while we reorganized it. 
Uh, ESP has been pretty strong consistently about 330 to 350 students for quite some time. So that means we've got over 500 undergraduate students alone. And then if you add in our 160 graduate students, we're at nearly 700 students in total. Um, and this is in part sort of um, uh, a part and parcel of being a large university. Uh, like a lot of geology programs, we're a discovery degree. Not a lot of students come out of high school saying they wanted to be a geologist when they grew up. They find us. And since there's 50,000 kids walking around, a lot of them find us along the way. Um, so that's one challenge. We're just, we're big. We got many degree granting programs. You can see there's eight degrees there. We also have three graduate certificates. Um, and then obviously got a lot of students in each one of those programs. Another challenge is it's been a long time since our last curriculum revision. Uh, I come from the geology side prior to the merger. Uh, our last major curriculum revision was over a decade ago. Um, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been things happening. There's been a ton of tinkering and drift. And you guys have all seen this in your own universities. Faculty come, faculty go. Uh, courses come online, others go offline. Um, courses switch hands between faculty as faculty move on to other priorities. Um, and so there's been a lot of, of, of change, some of it purposeful, some of it accidental. Um, and then we seem to be stuck in sort of endless reorganization. I mean, we, you know, we formed Geosciences in fall of 2013. There's a ton of reorg that, that happens because of that. We did that on purpose, but there's a lot of other reorganization that goes on around us at all times. And it seems like that's some, sometimes how we define as a university that we're actually, actually making progress is that we redo the general education curriculum or we, what we're currently doing right now is redoing um, uh, how we manage programs and degrees and students across the USF system. Um, in the midst of that, our president abruptly retired. Um, and so we're going through sort of another reorg, I'm sure, starting uh, next July when a new president comes in and thereafter probably new provost. So um, it's easy to say, well, this isn't the right time to, you know, to take this on. Um, but I, I'm convinced that if we wait for the right time, we're never going to do it. Um, uh, so we forged ahead. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we've done, we, we decided to take a big step backwards and look at this um, broadly across all of our, our programs. Um, and we took sort of a, what it turns out is the most popular approach to this, which is the matrix approach. And like Carol, we changed, you know, what Dave Moak had, had, had provided as an example um, to suit our needs. Um, and so we organized our columns on four different organizational themes. Um, one is discipline specific knowledge. We had 27 categories there. That would be like, you know, students, are learning to identify and classify rock types and minerals and hand samples and thin sections, right? Those are the, 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 the nuggets that we think that they need to know. Uh, we had seven categories under what we called habits of mind. That would be like spatial reasoning or quantitative literacy. Uh, 10 categories under transferable skills, um, writing, for example. And then we added another one, six categories under what we called high impact practices. And those are practices that have been shown to result in enhanced student outcomes like internships or study abroad, things of that nature. Uh, I'm going to show you our matrix and you couldn't possibly read them. I won't be able to either. Um, if you'd like more information on these, I'd be happy to forward our um, example to you. There's my email there. And of course, um, if you don't know much about this matrix approach, there's a great website hosted by Carlton um, where you can uh, learn more about the pedagogy underlying it and, and, and see more examples beyond the USF example I'll show you in a moment. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, as Carol said, this is hard to do. Uh, excuse me, Sharon said that. Carol said they did it by email. I didn't have any um, confidence that I could get 43 faculty to, to, to do it at all, let alone to do it consistently. Um, and so we uh, had a full day um, um, retreat. Um, it was out of the department. Uh, we provided breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we all went out and drank beer afterwards uh, to decompress. Um, it started like this, and it's sort of a classroom setting. As I said, my head, you could barely see way up in the front. I was sort of setting the stage for what we were going to do. It soon uh, broke down into, into pandemonium as, as faculty um, sort of self-organized into groups. 
um, and, and went group to group to make sure that we were all sort of doing it consistently and um, amongst the various programs that we have. Um, uh, but we got it all done in one day. Um, and um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. This is what the geology matrix looks like as of just a couple of days ago. This was a, a recent revision of it. Um, and so those columns, if you could possibly read those, um, there's a big section. Oh, no, don't do that yet, but that's okay. Leave that there. <laughs> Make it go away. That's fine. The, the, along the top are, are those, those four broad um, organizational themes, the discipline-specific skills, the habits of mind, the transferable skills, and the high-impact practices. And then each column represents one category under that. And then the courses are down uh, the rows. That, that first block above the black line are the required courses for geology, BA and BS. That second block um, uh, between the black lines is the required courses for the BS. Those are all different sections of field camp. Um, our students have to take at least three of those. They're, they're two-week sections um, on, on hydrology, uh, geophysics, volcanology, structural geology, um, and coastal geology. Um, and then at the bottom, there are most of the um, electives that we teach on a regular basis. Um, and then the colors uh, are uh, green means um, that's something that's um, repeatedly reinforced, that's repeatedly assessed. A student couldn't possibly get out of that class without uh, achieving some level of mastery. Uh, yellow would be Oh, it's kind of reinforced and assessed a bit. Um, we expect the students would need at least proficiency to get out of that class. Red means we just introduce it. Um, easily a student could come through that course without um, having much uh, mastery or proficiency at all. White means we don't cover it at all. Um, and now if you'll advance, uh, so some things pop right out at you that, and that are a little bit surprising. The first one here is there's a lot of white there. Um, uh, white Carol, we have to drive six to eight hours to see an outcrop. Um, a lot of our students don't move very far when they graduate and they get a job uh, locally or regionally. And in Florida, down on the peninsula, that probably means you're going to do water. And so we think of ourselves as an environmental hydro, or excuse me, an environmental geology program with a strong emphasis on water. Uh, that blank spot, all that white, uh, are, is the discipline-specific skills related to uh, hydrology. Um, so you got to kind of look closely to see that we actually do what we say to do, or we're trying to do, but a student could easily not. So if you look in that top block, those are the required courses. There's one group there that's green. So that's a course that's required. Students take that course and they're going to get a decent uh, course in physical hydrology. Um, but in that middle block field camp, there's one section that covers hy hydrology, um, the others not so much, and students don't have to take the hydrology section. Then you get to the bottom, of course, those are electives. Students could or, or could not take that bottom one uh, that's also got a lot of green in it. Um, there's actually one more course that doesn't show up because it's more geochemistry, but it's an aqueous geochemistry course. So you could imagine a student could get th four uh, really good courses in, in hydrology and come out with a bachelor's degree with a pretty good grounding in hydrology, but they could also not, right? They could take that one course at the top and then they're done with it. There's not a lot of reinforcement in the other courses. Um, so we're undergoing a little bit of navel gazing right now thinking about, you know, what does that mean in terms of how we're preparing our students uh, for the workforce? If you'll advance one more time, this was another interesting uh, moment. So that column there has to do with map making, which I think we all agree is sort of a fundamental uh, a skill for a geologist. And obviously in that middle block, every one of the field camp sections teaches mapping. Now, we usually teach hydrology first, and I teach that section along with my wife, uh, Kyrene's. Um, and we're always astounded that our students stuck at mapping. And it's supposed to be this capstone event, and we think, well, why are they, why, why am I teaching them how to hold a button, or you know, why am I teaching them trigonometric functions so that they could figure out how to turn a compass and chain survey uh, into um, an x y coordinate? 
Well, it turns out because we don't actually teach that very <laughs> frequently to them, right? There's a lot of white there. If you go above, for example, into the required courses, there's 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 no course that they're required to take where they're really getting mastery of mapping. They get there's one yellow box there, so they're going to get a little bit of proficiency. A couple of red boxes saying they're reintroduced to it, and then down at the bottom, they could easily get through our curriculum, uh, our elective curriculum without uh, getting a lot of, of mapping as well. So, you know, there's a great opportunity to look at that and say, oh, okay, so they're not good at mapping because we don't teach it to them. Um, and um, obviously there's opportunities for us to augment that there. And if you'll advance it one more time, uh, way over on the right-hand side are our high-end pra practices. Uh, this is one set of, of um, uh, categories that I don't think you'll see at the CERC um, website. We, we added this one specifically and there's a whole lot of things we don't do uh, um, uh, so the one of those is internships another one is is education abroad I don't recall what the third one is that's that's entirely white um, our students certainly can do those things um, but they are things that they individually work out with one of our faculty um, or with say education abroad elsewhere on campus um, and so lots of opportunities that we see for us to sort of um, improve um, on our, our delivery of those kinds of experiences. So that's sort of where we are. Um, uh, we're taking some of the same approaches that, that Sharon suggested. We've actually, you know, stepped back from the full faculty and there's a small group of us and we sort of dial people in and out of it as we look very carefully at this um, in terms of who we think we are, and who we want to be. And we're making some of the decisions um, one of which, for example, is um, uh, taking a transferable skill like writing, for example. We actually teach a course in scientific communications. It turns out our students don't exactly take it. It's an elective. Um, and uh, so we're actually going to close that section. We actually end up serving more science students elsewhere on campus. We're going to close that course and we're actually going to instead try to infuse that throughout the required curriculum. Um, and this brings up sort of one of those uncomfortable um, uh, comments that Sharon or, or, or conversations that Sharon referred to, where we have to engage faculty. You know, and nobody ever wants to be told what they're supposed to do in their courses, but we, we have to sort of carefully figure out how to have a conversation um, that, in, that empowers them to uh, allow either someone else to come into their course um, and they have to give up some time in order someone else could come in and teach them. Or, or they have to teach it themselves. Um, and so we're sort of in that stage right now where we're sort of darting back and forth amongst the small groups and, and individual faculty and trying to use this to guide um, um, the curricular changes that we're making. And that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for your insights. Um, we are now going to move into our question and answer session. Um, and we have had several questions roll in from the audience. So the first question is for Sharon. And it's asking about, did you look at the ASBOG task analysis survey of the profession that's used to develop the national geology licensing exams um, using, that is also used by the state licensing boards? Um, could you speak to a little bit of that? Uh, yes, that was something that was in a number of the discussions in each of those meetings that this was, you know, something to use. Uh, I personally, but others actually have taken the ASBOG and uh, compared it to the kinds of things that were recommended, particularly by the employers, and there's a really good match. Uh, one of the things that the employers recommended was that as you if, if you have students that end up taking that exam, that you actually have information for those students as to, okay, these are the specific courses that you need to take in order to do well on the exam. So that if you have, like a lot of people do, they have required courses and then they have electives, that students know which electives to take in order to get prepared for it. But there is a pretty strong uh, correlation between those, between what the employers uh, suggested in terms of granularity and also what you need for the ASBOG exam. Okay, great. And kind of another question along those lines for both um, Carol and Mark is, 
For LSU in South Florida, have you considered using the ASBOG curriculum program assessment tool, which is the CPAT, to compare how your students and graduates perform on the fundamentals of geology portion of the National Geology License exams? I'll go first, Mark. Um, this is Carol Wicks, LSU. The the GNG faculty debate that every year um, and decide not to do that. They are comfortable. Daryl Henry, who's a member of GNG faculty, was a member of the SACS review panel here at LSU, and he's very comfortable with how we're assessing and have stated our student learning outcomes for our bachelor's, master's, and PhD, and also all for our graduate certificates. So we bring it up every year, discuss it, and basically um, decide that we're not going to use the ASBOG assessment tool. Yeah, so this is uh, Mark uh, from USF, and uh, uh, I think we have the, exactly the same experience. Part of what, what we have to, to grapple with is that we have to assess geology, geography, environmental science, and policy. And, um, and if we get in the game of creating different assessment tools for all of our programs, it just it, it proliferates a ton of work for people. And so we've uh, worked hard to simplify our program assessments. Um, and, and much like Carol uh, at NLCU, we discuss whether or not we should use uh, those data and instead we we, we retreat to um, our own assessment procedures um, which are also quite frankly better fit um, uh, the, the, the the model that USF works for reporting back to SACS anyway. Um, yeah, us too. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another question for Sharon. Um, did any other smaller departments also make some of those curricular changes? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, for the respondents that came back, uh, we had a number of smaller departments and they actually did range from more research intensive PhD granting to the other. And uh, it didn't, I mean, I did a lot of analysts to see whether it made a difference in terms of size. And the only thing that really stuck out was that the uh, only one of the uh, two-year colleges actually looked at curricular redesign, which makes sense because they generally don't necessarily have a curriculum in geosciences. But there was no particular uh, focus based on the size. How they approached it varied with the size, uh, but not whether they actually did it or not. So for example, with the larger ones, a lot of them tried the retreat uh, or, or had a uh, core committee that worked with uh, the f uh, faculty. Um, and the smaller ones, of course, could have the entire faculty working on it. The one thing I will say is I heard as many that did not succeed as succeeded. So one of the problems, uh, particularly with some of the larger groups, was that they actually uh, started with a core group that were really interested in it. And then when they got to the faculty level, the faculty were like, well, wait a minute, we're not going to do this. So that was the uh, advice about making sure you have, you know, information going to the faculty as you go through this, if you have a large faculty. Great. Fantastic. Um, there was a question about some transfer students, and I think each of you can probably speak to this. Um, with your first and second year courses, how do you handle transfer students? Um, this individual indicated that two thirds of their students don't come in to, into the geosciences until their second or even sometimes their third year. I, I'll go first again. Um, we're also, <clears throat> like Mark said, we are a, a discovered degree. There's, there's not many high school students think about doing being geology, so we have left the the we have left two pathways. We require that everyone go through the historical geology for geology majors. We allow students to come through the general education um, physical geology course, but we also make sure that they've taken that math prerequisite. 
then they can go into the historical geology for geology majors. So we need to catch them in that first semester out of that general education course. And then we need to work with them individually, and we do to build up some of the laboratory skills that they might have missed. So we kind of have left a door open a little bit to bring them in. When we get transfer students from community colleges, um, we just have to work with them one-on-one -on -one and find out what's going to work to get them prepared. It's really getting them ready to get into mineralogy and get it, making sure they have some of those math skills um, ready to go. That's yeah, and then this is Mark again. It, um, it, this is a really big deal for us uh, because about half the students at USF writ large um, come from a two-year college. Um, only half our students are first time in college freshmen. And um, and so, and then we might still, you know, they still don't come in necessarily wanting to be geologists and we might get them even later still. So we might get students kind of closing in on their junior year before we, we see them the first time. And then just sort of basic sequencing of courses and, you know, their own schedules and, and so on and so forth. We get students that are taking courses sort of out of sequence. Um, uh, at least out of sequence the way we would like to sort of layer them. So it's a big deal to us um, and, and it's sort of so far been an intractable problem. Um, we solve it to some extent by um, we, we've, and this is also due to just our numbers alone. We teach our core courses every semester, which we didn't used to do um, to make it a little easier for, for students to, to, to take the courses in, in a coherent sequence. Uh, but it's still a problem, um, uh, and um, a lot of when I talked about a lot of the, sort of the tinkering and drift that's happened over the years has has occurred because of that. Like where it used to be one person taught this class, now two do because we don't want the same person having to teach it fall and spring, um, uh, and then tinkering, you know, various ways to to um, um, try to accommodate these these uh, transfer students. Um, I don't think we've been super successful. I don't have any insight into it, only that if you're struggling with it, you're not alone. So uh, one of the th things that a number of, well, I guess the Heads and Chairs Summit we had, we had a lot of discussion about what to do about transfers uh, from two-year colleges to four-year colleges and the issues that both Carol and Mark were talking about. And uh, a number of the uh, universities that we back actually had taken some of the advice and tried to implement some of these things that were suggested and really the most effective thing that was discussed was if you have a two-year college that sends a lot of students to you is really working with those faculty uh, to make sure that the students are prepared and even having those students uh, in the two-year colleges that are interested in the geosciences and interested in transferring uh, be invited to go on field trips or uh, have them as interns in the summer or at least you know invite them to come to seminars and things like that to try to uh, build a relationship between the faculty in those two-year schools and the four-year schools uh, so that you don't have as many of these issues. Great. Thank you. Now, um, for Carol, did you use a department, departmental retreat to get your faculty to talk about and work on this, or did you do this via faculty meetings over a period of a semester, for example? We did it over in faculty meetings over the period. I would say we spread it out over an academic year because we had to remove columns and add columns. We moved columns around to make it be to make the grid LSU grid. We talked about having a retreat um, that there was not really a lot of interest on part of the faculty of having a retreat. We just wanted to take a piece, let it digest, take a piece, let it digest. So we, we kind of moved a little more slowly through long faculty meetings. <laughs> that makes sense, absolutely. Now, um, this participant says that one of their goals is to make their curriculum simpler and more flexible. And so the matrix approach appear, appears fairly complex, 
Um, so do you find that the matrix approach can be a, compatible with simplifying a geoscience curriculum? That's open to everyone. I, I actually do. Um, if you look at the matrix approach, there's these big bins that Mark talked about, um, habits of mind, that if you wanted to make something a little simpler, you could just look at the data from, at that level. You wouldn't have to drill down into the individual columns. So what we did in some of ours is we added, we, we're very much on a high, uh, high end practice called, um, course embedded research experiences. So we took a communication skills and some lab skills and some research skills and we put that under our new bin, course embedded research. So you can ask higher order questions by staying up at sort of the broad column area, not the individual level, I, I personally think. Yeah, and this is Mark. I, I, I agree. And, and, and in fact, I actually think the matrix itself is a simplification. Um, you know, if, if you try to think about your curriculum without some sort of summary tool, at least for me, I, maybe I'm not smart enough, it's impossible. It, it just seems like, yeah, we teach a ton of courses at different times, and I'm not sure what's in them because everybody has their own uh, teaching style, and, and, you know, they probably don't teach it the way I learned it myself. And so I found that constructing the matrix was, was complicated because, like Carol, we had to change the columns. Um, uh, which we did sort of in subcommittee. And then we had to get everybody together and we had to do it and someone had to key it in and, and now we're having to look at it. But as we look at it, like I said, I mean, I was, I was able to really quickly find those three examples uh, that I was able to share with you. It didn't take me much more than two or three minutes of looking at it to start realizing that we had some pretty big gaps and some places that we didn't think we had gaps and we certainly didn't want them. Um, so, so in it, the way I look at it, constructing, it might be a little bit difficult, but once you've got it in your hands, it simplifies the problems, um, that you can then set about solving. I agree. When we went through it and, um, I pulled all the data together, it was just the gap in quantitative skills was sticking out like a sore thumb. It was three columns of white, um, at the lower level courses. And I knew everyone who taught the electives at the upper level expected quantitative skills. Um, and there, our frustration was, why aren't they ready? Well, we weren't getting them ready. <laughs> this is very interesting insights. Can each of you speak to um, and share a little bit about some of the setbacks and um, particular challenges that you faced? Maybe some other ones that you haven't um, already mentioned. You can go first, Mark. And I'll, I'll end. How's that? That, that sounds good. Um, I, 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 the hardest thing, quite frankly, was finding the bandwidth amongst a select group of people to motivate to get this started. The Heads and Chairs Summit was uh, January of 16. We held that. Um, retreat in January of 18. Um, it just, you know, with all the other moving parts in the world, it's hard to find the time to sit down amongst a small group of people even um, and, and, and develop this. And then, you know, to sort of do the politicking to get faculty buy-in and then get everybody sort of in advance to, 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 to get 43 people. We had almost full attendance uh, to set aside a, an entire day and come to retreat. All that stuff took time, and and I think Sharon said the fir her first two bullets were patience, <laughs> and I think that was a uh, something I hadn't expected, but that I I learned to embrace. It took a, it just took a lot of time. It took a lot of time for LSU also. But our frustration, and I I I mentioned this is um, so we had what we thought was a a critical course for our geoscience majors, and we could not we have not gotten course approval. So we had to find a way around. That was incredibly frustrating because the faculty were on board. They wanted to see this done. We had a couple young faculty who wanted to teach it. I mean, we were, we were gung ho. And then we absolutely could not get course approval through the LSU sort of course approval process, which was incredibly frustrating. Um, 
and it it just takes a it just takes a long time. It takes a lot of patience. It just does. So um, I'm looking at the results from the uh, action plan responses, and one of the big problems a lot of people had was just they would have a couple really resistant faculty. Sometimes a lot of resistant faculty, but sometimes just a couple, uh, particularly senior faculty that had more uh, institutional power uh, that were resistant because they felt like they were being told what to teach um, as well as how to teach. Uh, another, a lot of, actually a surprising number, um, probably a, th you know, a fourth of the groups had upper administration problems in terms of just like Carol described is where they knew what they wanted to do and, you know, they couldn't get it approved. And I think, that that is where using the fact that, that we have this community agreement uh, at, that's been vetted by employers can be useful. And I hope the vision and change document will help that way. Um, uh, the other is, uh, you know, you know, simple things like uh, lack of funding to make the changes they wanted, or just it took too much time and people weren't willing to put the time into it. Uh, only six of the, groups that reported just found it totally insurmountable that they either due to the faculty or the upper administration they just couldn't couldn't get anything done great and sharon going off of that um can you explain a little bit more about the vision and change document that you mentioned uh yeah i mean we've we've gathered a tremendous amount of data and uh, have uh a lot of information that is being used by a number of, you know, a large number of departments across the country, but it's all been in terms of meeting results. It's in the form of, you know, handouts and uh, PowerPoints and things like that. And it's all on the website that I had up uh, earlier. Uh, and the feedback we've gotten is that people really want a document. They want something that they can uh, take to their administration or take to their faculty uh, and say, you know, this is what the community has agreed on. This is what employers want. Uh, and these are the ways that you can uh, implement. So having some, you know, examples of how people have been able to take these things and implement them into uh, their uh, programs and what the best practices are. And so uh, this is what... Uh, the biological sciences did a number of years ago in terms of a vision and change document. It was dominantly for, you know, sort of uh, introductory uh, biology or uh, undergraduate biology students. Um, but I think this document will be uh, helpful because it will codify everything. Yeah, absolutely serve as a resource to the community so that they can actually use it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, right now, I think we have answered all the questions from the audience. Um, actually, we have one more that just came through. Um, they would like us to send out the link for the document. I'm assuming that's the vision and change document that we were just, um, yeah, or show it on the screen, the vision and change document. Is that what you mean, Benjamin? Well, we don't have the change yet. document yet, but there is at the, uh, my first slide, there is a link to the web page that has all the information. What? All the PowerPoints and all the talks and all the handouts, everything. Very mm -hmm. there at the bottom. At the bottom? Yeah, that. Okay, yes. So for all of the available resources so far, uh, please follow this link that's found at the bottom of the slide here. And when do you expect the vision and change document to um, be completed and, and available for distribution, Sharon? <laughs> I wish I knew. No, we, <laughs> just got, we just got funded last month. Uh, and so I guess I would say within two years at the minute at the maximum hopefully great. sooner than that great fantastic well 
I believe those are all the questions we have from the audience. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Pranodi and get to these ending slides for some um, concluding announcements.